So it's lovely to be here yet again with um, our annual conference, a uh, very strange annual conference, uh, but it's great that we all made it. I may be joined by Betty the cat, who really, really enjoys webinars. Um, I have shut the door, Betty knows how to open the door. So if a cat suddenly appears, uh, don't, don't be too um, alarmed. So for those of you who, who don't um, know me, which is probably most of you from looking at the screens, um, I, um, I'm a social worker by profession and I worked uh, for local authorities for, um, oh gosh, 34 years before leaving local authority employment four years ago. I, I like and I work purely on safeguarding adult themes. I write safeguarding adult reviews. I write guidance these days too um, and training, um, auditing, whatever, anything to do with adult safeguarding. I am your woman. Um, so I have a happy little world which is full of anything adult safeguarding um, and not much else. So today I'm going to be talking about making safeguarding personal and families. I'm going to talk, I think, for about 40 minutes and Esther has instructions to mute me after 40 minutes so I don't ramble on. Um, normally when um, I present at these conferences we kind of have an interaction and a chat but that's quite hard to do um, virtually and it's hard to do with so many of you so sadly I am just going to be talking for 40 minutes with some slides thank goodness um, and um, then we should have another 20 minutes or so to have a discussion which will be absolutely great. So I'm going to explore some of the basic themes now and I'm going to screen share and fingers crossed you can all see it so that you can see some slides to help you think about um, these ideas as well as listening to me. So start uh, slideshow, that's it. Let's see if this works from the beginning. Okay, how are we doing? Can everyone see the slideshow? Yeah, that's yeah thumbs up, okay. brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much. So families are making safeguarding personal perspective. So let's just check out some basics really. What, what do we mean by um, making safeguarding personal? And, and for me at the very nub of making safeguarding personal is this idea that the people we're working with are, are experts in their own lives. Uh, no way are we experts in their lives. Um, we are only really experts in our own lives. I'm an expert in the life of Kate Spreadbury. I have lived in this body for 62 years now. I know exactly what I like, what I don't, what I'm capable of, uh, what I wish to do next, etc., etc. So our real expertise is in, if you like, the meaning of our own existence and our own lives. And that's true for everyone that we work with. And because of this, the views and wishes of everybody we work with are at the center of any efforts we might make to ensure that person has their human rights. Um, and that in a sense is still the essence of adult safeguarding, the promotion of the person's human rights. And we'll look at those human rights in a moment. Some people will need representation to support them to express their wishes. Um, very often that representation can come from their own families and whatever they think of as their family. And we'll look at what a family is in a moment. So people might need representation to support them to express those wishes. If that person is, has the capacity to make that decision, then that representative needs to be there with their consent. If they do not have capacity to make a decision about who should represent them, then that representative has to have their best wishes at heart. But already we can see that some people will need the support, families, friends, etc., to engage with adult safeguarding, to engage with making plans about their own safety. And through looking at the system around the person, the people they consider being within their family group, we might be able to include that in any consideration of what are the strengths in that person's lives, what might help them live a life of good quality and comfort, which is the other aim of safeguarding when we're considering making safeguarding principles. How do we improve, not just keep a person safe from risks, whatever that again means to them, but how do we improve the quality of life? How do we make that life much more comfortable and livable with that person? So looking at the strengths in their, their lives that may help with that. Okay, so just touching in here now, human rights. 
Um, human rights very much direct um, how I think of adult safeguarding and are at the heart of, of everything we do if we work with people. Um, and the primary human right um, that I think about with adult safeguarding is the right to life. And of course, I think about it quite a lot now because I mainly write safeguarding adult reviews and mainly most people have died before we do a safeguarding adult review. So the right to life is very uh, prominent in my mind, but it is one of the primary things we're thinking about when we're thinking about safeguarding. What are the risks to the person? Is there a risk to their vital interests? Some people uh, phrase it, their right to life. Uh, freedom from torture or um, inhuman or undignified treatment. Article three is also something else that should always be in our heads. The right to liberty and security or Article 5, that's the human right really that supports uh, what we still call deprivation of liberty safeguards, what we may call liberty, liberty protection safeguards at some point in the future. And a right that's very foremost in our minds today, respect for private and family life, Article 8, um, and how we uphold those rights for people and why those rights might be very important and how we might balance those rights or help that person to balance those rights with other human rights. So I'm going to kind of, of look at those particular human rights as, as we move through um, our presentation today. Um, if you want to know any more about human rights and get some lovely examples of how they apply to our day-to-day -day work, then the British Institute of Human Rights website is a, is a good place to go and look. So um, I'll put a link to that in at the end. So what we need to do is think about the systems that people are part of, with family as very much part of that system. To remind us of that is the, the, the John Dunn um, meditation uh, which I often think of when I think about systems working, actually, when I think about families. He wrote it in 1624, so forgive him that he's talking about men and not humankind. But yes, no man is an island entire of itself. Each is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. We're all part of something bigger than ourselves. And I think the third verse is also a bit appropriate for us at the moment as well. Each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. But that meditation speaks over the hundreds of years um, of how we are connected ultimately um, to something we call family, to something we call community. Um, and each one of those things can mean something different, really, to all of us. So part of making safeguarding personal is finding out what does the person consider part of their family, community, system, network, whatever we call them. How, how does it look um, to them? And what is a family anyway? We, we may have our own assumptions and thoughts about what does a family mean and what is it? So some people think of family in terms of blood or legal ties. So here we have, um, I suppose, the, uh, the premier of family um, in the UK, our royal family, who've all got lots of legal ties and blood ties and genetic ties, and there they all are in festive mood. Um, so many people, when you say family, might, might just think of that, blood and legal ties. When, in fact, family does not have to be and is often not constructed in that particular way. There have, over the years, perhaps, and I'm, I'm thinking it has got better, but there have been some misunderstandings about uh, terms like next of kin. And so people think that next of kin can be only somebody who you have a blood or legal tie to, when next, next of kin in itself has no legal definition, really. Um, in the UK, you can nominate anybody that you want to be your next of kin. This is very different from concepts like nearest relative, which is a legal concept and is enshrined in the Mental Health Act. And only certain people from a, a kind of list that, that goes down um, can be your nearest relative. Um, or from the concept of closest relative, which is a legal concept that we employ when someone has died in testo without a will. And then we will look for their closest relatives to inherit to hopefully arrange funerals, to pay for funerals and so forth. But that is only if someone hasn't specified perhaps in their will who they want money to go to or in their will who they want to arrange their funeral, um, who they have made provision to pay for their funeral. So we don't have to just have our blood or legal family 
to arrange things for us. Um, and if we start using making safeguarding personal, we start needing to talk to people about families in much, much wider terms. So for many, many people, families are chosen. They're the people that we might have deep and everlasting friendships with who know us better than our family. For many members, for example, of the um, LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community, um, the people, their partners, their same-sex partners are, of course, family. Uh, for years, but no longer, there would not have been a legal tie. Now there is, or a legal tie is available. But so much sadness um, has been caused over the years, and many older people that we work with will remember this, in that family, blood and legal family, were considered the primary family, the next of kin, and involved in matters of serious illness or death to great, great distress because the real family was the family that one was partnered with, that one loved, or one's real community was the community of other people who shared the same experiences and lives. Um, so it's making sure that whatever community means, it is part of how we make decisions, how we work with people, how we talk with people. Each family, I think it was Dame um, Eileen Munro, who's written a lot about short child protection and systems thinking. Uh, Eileen Munro says every family is a different culture because they all have different kinds of rules and ways of working. But one also must be reminded that each culture has its own construct of family. So for me, I, I grew up in a white uh, rural working class community in Wiltshire. And in my village, when I was a kid, I had loads and loads of aunties and uncles. Uh, I wasn't not really sure at all until I was about 16 whether I was actually related to any of them and I think I was very disappointed to find out I was only actually, well I only actually had one uncle and one auntie but in the village I had 15, 20 aunties and uncles and they were uh, not just part of my community, they helped raise me, um, they were my close kin um, they were also very judgmental and critical and kept an eye on everything I did. So very irritating, but they were all there. And so when I was younger, if I had to talk about family, I would include those aunties and uncles in my concept of family. And many, many other people also do that. They have people that they are close to, might not be related to, but are considered family and close as family. So we need to look out for chosen families or, or given families, community families, and community in a geographical sense, as well as community in the sense of people who share life experience. People will all have different constructions of those families. Um, and then we come on to other uh, families and communities. So for many, many people who have lived in care settings, or with stable staff groups for years and years and years, those staff groups are family. Um, those staff groups will um, support you and be there for you as family. And I have many examples of that. And one quite recent one from a safeguarding review I did in Gloucester was about uh, a young woman who ultimately went to prison and served, was serving a very, very long sentence for something she did when um, she was um, living in the care home. And her visitors were her mum and the care workers who had been caring for her for almost a decade. And they're still visiting her. Um, her sentence is very long, but over the years, those care workers have kept going and kept visiting that young woman in prison as part of a very close uh, group, close family group. I also hear stories from, from others who work, have worked in care are with people over many, many years, but have found that when they're towards the end of their lives or when their funerals need to be planned, their legal or blood family kind of takes over, which is fine, but there needs to be boundaries where the family that live together in the group setting is also considered as well, um, because many of those people have um, grief or want to share in their fellow residents. Um, ending, so on and so forth. And the last bit, oh my goodness, the companion who never let you down and who many of us also consider as family. And um, yeah, 
I have been, I was once called to do some safeguarding in a care home where there was a cat. Oh, and it's a bit like the whole dilemma about families, isn't it? The, the cat was beloved, the cat was much loved, but the cat caused so many skin tears and injuries to the residents. You know, how, how does one balance that whole upset really? But for many of us going into hospital, going into care, uh, being ill or whatever, or having carers, we have to consider the person's uh, uh, other furry family members as well. So just examples of lots and lots of different types of family. So the psychological theories behind family, and I'm so sorry about the, the, the big label, it, it wouldn't come out of the way. Um, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which many of you will have seen and used um, over the years. And so our basic needs are about being fed and keeping warm and having water, our right to life, Article 2 rights, and being safe and feeling secure, um, which uh, is a big challenge for lots of us at the moment, really. And then up from those basic needs are our psychological needs, our need for belongingness and love, our need to have friends, to have intimate relationships, to have people that we're close to. And without those particular needs being met, it's very hard for us to feel whole it's very hard for us to really um, feel the sort of self-regard, self-esteem, but also feel happiness really that we get from being part of something that's much bigger um, than our own, our, our own selves. If people are connected, if they're connected with whatever they call their family, we can see that they develop some resilience and reduction of social isolation and so much has been written about socialization i'm not going to talk about it um, at the moment but what i will say is that from, for many people that i've worked with over the years or talked to um, the loss of the friendship group as much as the family group has been so dreadful because you've got no one to talk things over with anymore you haven't anyone to say i don't know i don't know what i make of that do you think it's a scam or what do you think he's up to or you'll never guess what happened to me today and all of those things that help us make up our minds help us problem solve and so forth and we may do that with our close families or communities or our friendship net um, networks and so forth maslow again the idea of belonging quality of life and the prevention of abuse and neglect so what i observed and just one example of this is over the years is how much family and close friends look out for you and make sure that you're getting what what you need uh, and that you're not left really um, unattended so if i looked say i mean one particular um, example came to mind but a really 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 poor care home um, unusually poor care home and looking at every person who lived at that care home and realizing that the people who were most neglected whose basic needs really weren't being met and who we were most concerned about were the people who had no visitors who had no family to make fuss or make complaints or phone somebody up or keep checking back the people who had no one really uh, were the people who uh, were most at risk in that particular setting family can contribute to problem solving they can provide options they can also give completely unsought advice and most of us have experience of that but they are a resource a resource that often knows you well that can contribute to those efforts and as we said earlier someone who's part of someone's family network can be their representative can speak up on their behalf and support them to keep to speak up during the pandemic I've seen organisations working extremely hard to reduce the impact of loss of connectedness. Um, it is one of our many risks at the moment, and I can see everybody trying to find ways of making that happen. What I've also observed is that for people who live in care settings, their connection with staff has become so much more important um, as they have often been their only um, real human contact. Um, it'll be interesting to see where we go with that and and you know hats off to all of the staff who've actually moved in with the people that they're caring from and become a very very present um, connection and network but families are not always so wonderful as i guess many of us on this call already know so if we look at the safeguarding adults collection which is the national collection of all safeguarding uh, data 
um, over the last year that we have it for at the moment, which is 2018-19, I guess the 1921 will be, usually comes out about November, it's coming out soon I would think, but anyway, for those years, around about half of the inquiries that local authorities undertook into alleged abuse or neglect, the source of risk was somebody that somebody that the individual knew, not always a family member, often a family member, also someone who's a friend or a neighbour or an acquaintance, someone who they may have trusted and felt close to or relied upon in some way. What really, really serves us well um, when we're using, well, making safeguarding personal is, is so much adult safeguarding now that I'm just gonna stop saying making safeguarding personal, but hey, this is what this is about. But in any adult safeguarding, we really have to engage something called professional curiosity. Um, and in case you can't read the bit um, in the little picture, it's a quote that's dear to me, it's by Malcolm X. And it says, I could spend the rest of my life reading, just satisfying my curiosity because you can hardly mention anything I'm not curious about. So some of us came into the work that we do out of um, or a sense of wanting to make a difference to our society or, or, or being involved and, and, and that's great and some of us came in because we have an insatiable curiosity about how do people work and what are their lives like and, and so on and many of us have, have all the same motivations. Professional curiosity is very very valuable, it's not being a nosy parker, it's, it's not you know sticking your nose in where you shouldn't, uh, it's not invading people's privacy um, as long as you're asking your questions, your curiosity out of a sense of genuine concern about how are you and what is your life like and are you really okay? So it's okay to be curious about what a person's life is like and about how they feel and about why they behave as they do. We got in the most terrible, I think, trap um, a few years back and I think for some people it's still going on about the Mental Capacity Act and I would constantly hear, read, see um, situations where people would say well I said to Mr Jones um, well I, I, I talked to him about why he's living like this and I decided you know he seems to me to have capacity to decide to live in this way so I said well you know I haven't really got the right to interfere now and that's his decision it may be an unwise decision oh but it's a lifestyle choice and all of this kind of tangled up thinking which often stopped the person saying so what's led you to live like this what you know what what, what happened what are the stages how long have you has this been happening how long so we don't use that curiosity, which is promoted by compassion and interest for the human being and their well-being, their welfare, um, if you like. So we often, or rather we do need to ask about how they are, how they're feeling, why they're behaving as they do. Thinking, keeping an open mind, professional curiosity is very much about being open-minded, not, not seizing on the first thing that you're told or comes to mind. It's so easy to do that in adult safeguarding because sometimes it sort of feels a bit risky and it's full of grey areas because human life is full of grey areas. So sometimes you want to see straight away on the first thing that you're told or the, the first thing um, that seems to you to, to be the real sort of answer or issue. But actually you just need to keep an open mind at all times about what's going on. So just a short story about this and it's a, um, a SAR safeguarding adult review um, in a local authority a long, long way away from here. And uh, let's call it the story of Dave and the closed doors. So Dave is um, a man in his 70s who's looking after his dad who's in his mid 90s now and who's very, very poorly. And Dave, Dave wants to care for his dad until the end. Uh, Dave is, seems really, really anxious and he is anxious. He's very anxious about his dad dying. Uh, he knows his dad's dying. He's very um, grateful for the huge amount of support that he's getting in terms of caring for his dad. So uh, Dave's dad is getting four visits a day from two carers at a time. He's getting frequent home visits from his GP. I must say Dave's dad's GP is, is just magnificent, really caring, visits a lot, district nurses visit community matron visits, the uh, community therapist visit, uh, who else? There are a huge number of quite regular visitors to this house. But Dave won't have a key safe. 
he keeps all of the doors shut apart from the door to his father's bedroom and um he likes people to make an appointment um dave is having dave's dad is having all this care uh people get to know dave this situation goes on for about two to three years having all of the doors shut and having no care say it's key safe occasionally does cause some problems um, especially if the carers want water or they want something to help them care for Dave's dad because Dave won't open the doors so he goes and trots off and gets the water and so on and so forth. So people never seem to have actually asked why Dave's shutting all the doors. They all record that Dave has the doors shut but they don't talk to Dave about why the doors are shut. But over time, so initially they think well Dave's a very private person and we shouldn't really infringe on his privacy. And then over time, they build up relationships with Dave and then they think, well, maybe Dave's a sort of hoarder or he doesn't keep things clean. And, you know, so, you know, we won't ask about the doors. So this situation continued for very many years. Um, and Dave's dad died one day. And um, so all of the doors were in the midst of the, the crisis and sadness opened. And indeed, um, Dave appeared to be not cleaning, doing some hoarding. But behind the doors, there are also some really, really odd things like tanks full of dead reptiles, which for a while people thought maybe something to do with Dave's hoarding, but it did transpire that these reptiles did not belong to Dave, they belonged to someone else. Um, there was also um, some property um, kept on the premises that probably did not belong to Dave. Sadly, a few, um, about a year after that, Dave also died and um, Dave's sister, um, managed to get into the house. I will say something about Dave's sister maybe later or maybe I won't. Um, nobody really seemed to know about Dave's sister or whether she was a family member because I guess they didn't ask about family either. Um, so Dave's sister got into the house and she discovered that there was none of Dave's identity documents left in the house. Um, there was no um, jewellery, there was no so all of Dave's personal effects, his properties, his identity documents had all gone. But what was left were some letters and papers with IOUs on it. Uh, and one of them said, thank you, Dave, for lending me um, this £10,000. I promise to pay you back when I can. So what began to slowly transpire is that Dave was probably very seriously exploited by a group of people that moved on and in on him um, as he began caring for his dad. The doors were often shut because there were things behind them. Um, the reptiles belonged to these people, not to Dave. And sometimes those people were behind the shut doors. So there's no way that I can think that any of those professionals knew about the exploitation and so forth, really not. But they did not exhibit any professional curiosity at all about why the doors were shut, how Dave was thinking, why he was behaving, what he was doing, um, or keeping any open mind in terms of what was going on. So we need to understand, if we're going to be person-centred, who a person considers family and what their views on, on these family members. So we need to hear and understand some of the family stories, because those are the stories that create the reality of the family. So in Dave's case, the story was that his sister had done something four years ago, which meant that no one was talking to her anymore. So his sister was a pretty benign influence really up to that point, but by not understanding or hearing the story, there was no chance to say to Dave, well, has anything changed, you know? And is there any way we can help with some mediation or some restorative work between you and your sister? Can we bring her back in or whatever? But we need to hear those, those family stories that create reality. When things go wrong, what has the family tried in the past? What's the individual tried and what happened? And is there anything that's different now? Because working with adults, adults move, as we all do, through a life course. We have different times in our lives. We have times when we understand our families, when we need them, times when we do not need them, times when we don't want them near. And sometimes towards the end of our, our time, we do want our family back. We do want reconciliation. We also will have tried things to work out problems between us that worked really well, say 20 years ago when we were physically stronger, um, which won't work so well now because we don't have physical strength or we're wiser or, yeah, so it's recognising that things change. So 
what can we try what have you tried before would it work now who might get in the way who might harm you what's happening now in your family and who can help who's someone that you can turn to who's someone that could come up with a, a bright idea um, and very often you can start really um, pulling out some of the strengths that there might be in the person's family network in terms of who might be able to step in, help or, or take something on. One way um, that I'm, I use to record uh, people's stories or work out with them what's happening um, in their family is something called a genogram. Um, or a family tree. So genograms were all the go when I was a young social worker um, and uh, we all learned to do them. And I think they've come back again because everybody's kind of looking for their own family trees and stuff, aren't they? I've sort of inundated with all DNA stuff and everything. So it, there's a link at the end of the presentation into, you know, how to do a genogram. And if you're going to use this way to just talk through with somebody who's in their family and what's been going on and what's the relationships and so forth, don't, don't be too worried about getting all the symbols and everything right. But if you do it in a way that has meaning to you and the person, it's a really good way to sort of get what the person's saying out visually too, so they can look at it and go, oh, hang on. No, I've got three cousins. Oh, goodness. I've only got two there. Don't know where the other one's gone or, or whatever. But just to really map out who's around in their family, who's around in the system and, and who's close and, and who can you work with and so on and so forth. Um, and that can be a helpful tool. So important that we look at the family as an entire system, that, that we think family, if you like. It's a slogan that's been around for around 12, yeah, about 12 years now. So are we still thinking about a family system rather than just that one individual that we um, are assessing or we are treating and so forth? But if we think about and talk about the entire family system, we're better placed then to identify and prevent harm. Um, in terms of what's going on in the family, who are you worried about, who aren't you worried about? Um, is there something brewing, something you're unsure about in your family? Might that be a way to prevent things? Um, supporting family members can live, lead to better outcomes for all vulnerable members of the family. So. Um, you know, a simple principle, in fact, that we all learned when we were thinking about Think Family to begin with, is that if a family cannot nurture a child very well, they're likely not to be able to nurture a disabled uh, relative, a disabled adult, an older adult, etc, etc. The nurturing quality in that family needs a lot of support and everybody really needs to be considered in terms of those concerns. If there is abuse of a grandfather, perhaps, what's happening to children, what's happening in the marital relationship, what's happening in that entire family system, what's the meaning of this family exploitation or violence, or et cetera, et cetera, or coercive control. And so equally, the strengths in that family system can also act as some protective factors. So, what does that family do very well? What can they help with um, in order to, to help them through and support them through uh, difficult times and become more resilient? So we need to think about that whole system. Dilemmas. Working with people is full of dilemmas and working with families um, very much so. And there's that poor little balloon there. Um, getting ready to step upon the pinheads. What goes wrong? This list is not exhaustive. Um, millions and millions of things can go wrong. We'll meet exhausted families, families uh, that have been caring for a very, very long time and have really, really uh, need breaks, need resilience, need support, and so forth. Critical families, families that no matter what you do, it's all wrong. Um, and their worries about their relative that you're, they're caring for uh, can never be um, assuaged. Family feuds, oh I don't like family feuds uh, because very often we get caught in the middle of them and certainly the person that we're caring for can get caught in the middle of the family feuds. They really are very painful. Neglectful families, families that for many different reasons aren't able to do that, that nurturing, aren't able to come up to the mark, just don't see that person's needs. And very often we'll find 
behind those neglectful families, um, issues of addiction, mental health, um, so on and so forth. Um, and overly protective families, families that are so full of anxiety for the person that they try to make decisions on their behalf. They can't let them take risks. They can't let them be independent and so on and so forth. And the kind of two spectres on the other side behind all of this is the possibility of domestic abuse and also exploitation um, by families, by networks, by acquaintances, friends, and so on and so forth. One of the things we can do um, as part of, again, making safeguarding personal, as part of using that professional curiosity uh, to promote making safeguarding personal is to uh, use our empathy and to inquire about emotion and to consider what emotions might be lying behind um, many of these behaviours. So we've talked about uh, the trap of addiction, how people might have to um, promote their own um, needs for substances or gambling or whatever beyond what they know in their hearts is best and how we can help with them. But there's also uh, emotions such as shame, um, how has it come to this? How have I not been able to cope and so forth? How must I hide things because I can't be seen not to be uh, strong, not to be independent? There's um, guilt um, that I could not cope or that I have shouted. Um, there is anger about what has happened in the past. And I mean, when one story that kind of really stays with me about a family um, that I was working working with some social workers who we were working with once um, was all about this neglectful family neglected their parent because what they were trying to cope with was the amount of uh, sexual violence sexual abuse that that parent had ignored when the children who were trying to care for that parent were younger and it wasn't until that family could start talking about that could start thinking about what had happened some 50 years in the past that those children could actually begin to um, engage with their parent who was not the neglect it was not the abusive parent but the parent who did not neglect, um, protect from abuse so all families have as i said before their own stories their own histories but they can um, impact on their care and giving and their behavior um, in the present um i think we're nearly out of time let's keep going so yes making calling personal approaches how excellent kate the last slide so we've said the person is an expert in their own lives they're also an expert in their own family history their knowledge and their perspective on their family history may not always be accurate we all remember our family history differently now and again my daughters tell me something i said or did in their childhood and I'm aghast because I don't remember it like that at all. And my daughters being very wise adults these days say, well, mum, that's how I remember it. And that's what's important. So each individual has their own memory and interpretation of family history. But that family history is very, very real in the here and now. And that family um, history and family culture is, is what um, impacts on their care now and their experience now and their access to their family now. So the person's an expert in their own family history. As outsiders, we can offer support, respectful challenge, which comes from our position of concern and professional curiosity. We can offer lots of options. People want to hear them. We can offer um, facilitation. I've put in a short link to something called family group conferencing, which is a wonderful um, idea and skill that you can either commission or learn and train in yourself which is about work, identifying family, who's in a family, really working with each member of the family on how, what they have to offer, what their perspective is on a certain concern or problem, and then bringing those family members together with um, the adult to do problem solving, to do working out um, as a family without your professional input and so forth. So some, some gorgeous, gorgeous uh, approaches to family work there. Um, and observe the person's human rights at all times. A lot of dilemmas can be around um, the person's rights to uh, private and family life. 
versus the person's right to life and the person's um, right to and freedom from inhuman treatment. And the balance of those is important. We cannot deprive a person of their family, even though that family is exploitive and abusive, but we also have to work through safeguarding to protect human rights. So it's the approach that how can we help a person continue to access their family whilst at the same time making sure that they have, and some of the cases I've seen are really quite basic, make sure that they have enough to eat and drink and are free from pain and are free from fear and so on and so forth. So even when a person is living apart from their family in a safer place, we need to ensure that access to family, that access to the things that give the person identity and meaning. Okay, I think that's it. There's some um, a few references here, but I think the slides are going to be up. I think I'm going to add the reference to the British Institute of Human Rights stuff as well um, after I stop sharing. So.